Hello, Tom. Today we're going to do an introduction, a short introduction to MBT. Now, MBT is a theory of everything. A toe, a big picture toe, a big toe. How did you arrive at these? <laughs> well, it's all, it's all of those things. It's a toe because it's a theory of everything, a T-O-E. That's a word that, uh, or an acronym that Einstein created uh, when he was looking for a toe that was going to derive both quantum mechanics and relativity. He didn't find that toe, but people have been looking for this big overall picture that explains everything. Now, from the scientific point of view, explaining everything just meant explaining quantum mechanics and relativity because those were the two uh, sciences that explained everything else. So that's why it, that was a toe theory of everything. And they knew there had to be this overarching theory because there's parts of quantum mechanics that are just philosophically at odds with parts of relativity. They just aren't compatible in some ways. And that means there must be something bigger that can derive both of them, something more comprehensive from which they're both apart. So each one of those sciences does some part, but it doesn't do everything. It just does a part. And there must be some science at the higher level of aggregation that actually derives those two and explains those two. Now mine's a big toe because I don't stop just with explaining the objective world, science, you know, quantum mechanics and relativity. I also explain the subjective world. So it's all about the physical world, the objective world, but it's also all about the subjective world, mind, as well as matter. So that's why it's a big toe. So would you say it unifies by building a common scientific foundation? Yes, that's exactly what it does. It it builds this foundation of understanding. You know, that's what we talk about when we, when we talk about a toe. It's a, it's a theory that lets you derive everything, including why you're unhappy, why you're struggling in life, uh, you know, why you feel unfulfilled. Those are all things that have nothing to do with the objective world. They have to do just with the inside world, but it describes all those things. So if you can describe all those things, then it becomes inclusive. Everyone and everyone's what needs to understand, be it the physical world or the interior world of mind, will all come to, will all find a structure, a logical scientific structure that explains to them what it is they need to know, what, what the issues are, what the problems are, and a logical uh, resolution of those issues. So yes, it's, it uh, kind of unites everything under one larger understanding. You say it's inclusive, which widely acceptable, because it defines a common unified understanding from Buddha, mystic traditions, to, and Eckhart Tolle, self-help and development, to Niels Bohr and John Wheeler, atheist and theists both find in MBT a logical system that explains and supports their views. Tell me about the application to physics. Well, yes, it is interesting that uh, you know, an atheist and a, and a theist can uh, both claim belonging to the same understanding because one would think that they are very opposite. They certainly must disagree that there would be no understanding that both a theist and an atheist, you know, could agree to, but that's not the case. You know, the theist can say, well, um, you know, the larger consciousness system, that's God. And the atheist can say, aha, there is no God, there's just a larger consciousness system. And now their difference just boils down to the word they want to use to describe the same thing. Well, that's a trivial difference. That's not really a substantial difference. It's just, it reduces all of their um, uh, discrepancies to simply the choice of a word. 
So, okay, about, about the science. It does describe the physical world and all things physical. Uh, in fact, I have some quantum mechanics experiments that uh, should be done in the next several months. At least I hope they'll be, be uh, at least partially done over the next couple of months that will lend a lot of evidence to this theory, to this overarching uh, big toe. It will help explain quantum mechanics as a logical science rather than a, should we say, a weird science is the way scientists call it now. So yes, it, it uh, is um, falsifiable and it can be verified by experiment. And it can be verified by experiment in many ways. So it's a, it is a science. It's not just another set of beliefs. It's really a, a genuine, legitimate, scientific model. The fundamental concept in MBT is that reality is information-based, an idea that it's gaining ground rapidly among physicists worldwide. Yes, it is. I'd say that um, 25, 30 percent of all the physicists out there probably a higher percent if you just talk to the younger ones, or even a higher percent yet if you just talk to the younger ones that are in the best institutions, you know, like Caltech and the MITs and over in Europe, at CERN and other places where the, where the best tend to, tend to uh, get together. And that is because quantum mechanics and also neuroscience and several other things, biology as well, have been pointing toward this being an information-based reality. So it's gone in a decade and a half from a crazy idea to an idea whose time has come in science. It is the biggest growing concept in science. And it is a game changer. It's a big, big paradigm shift for science to go from a material-based reality to an information-based reality. Now, a good theory has few assumptions. How many assumptions does MBT theory have? It has just two. Yes, it's said in, in uh, physics that if you are trying to describe something fundamental, then it has to be simple and it has to be elegant. And part of that, uh, is what's called Occam's razor, which is a, a philosophical thing that says that the simpler thing is likely to be true. If something is, is usually complex, and if it's a fundamental thing, then it's probably not true. The fewer assumptions, this is one of Einstein's quotes, you know, the aim of all physics, he said, was to explain the largest number of facts with the fewest number of assumptions. And basically, I have just two. One, that consciousness exists, which is not too wild since we all believe we're conscious, and that evolution exists as a, as a, um, a process whereby try everything and keep what works. Discard what doesn't. That's the basic uh, process of evolution. I think Einstein would be very happy. <laughs> Tell me something about the origins of MBT. Well, it started, I guess, when I first learned to meditate. That was probably the beginning of my understanding of a bigger reality. And I was in graduate school. I saw a sign on a door going into the physics building that says, get by on less sleep. And I said, ah, perfect, I need to get by on less sleep. That's the way it is when you're a graduate student. There's too much to do always and too little time to do it in. So I went to a, this meditation course with a banana and $25, which is all it took in those days. And I learned, I was given a mantra and I was taught how to meditate. Well, about three months later into meditating, uh, I think once or twice a day, which was their prescription, I found that I could debug computer code. 
And that was a big deal, debugging computer code. And I could do that with my mind much more accurately and quickly than I could if I actually sat and looked at the computer code. I could get into an altered state in meditation. I could bring up the picture in my mind of my computer code and every line that had an error in it would be, had a red, you know, had a red flag on it. The line was red ink rather than black ink. And I'd look at the line and because I wrote all those lines of code, I was very familiar with every line. And uh, I'd go check it later and find out that indeed that line did have an error in it, which was really wonderful because back in that day it was punch cards and I had four, five, ten thousand punch cards and finding errors may actually not have anything at all to do with the code. It may just be that the card punch was a little off on that hole and that would produce an error. So in my mind I could find even those lines where the holes were off as opposed to there was an error in the code. So somehow I was getting information about the errors in my software that I was writing without looking at it, the printout. They just came as a picture of red instead of black on, the, on those lines. And otherwise I didn't look at all the lines, they just flashed by and then a red one would come up and I'd stop it and then I, once it stopped I could read it. It's like they were turning almost like a wheel, you know, they were just flashing by and flashing by. Like I guess if you, uh, these days with a computer, if you had the mouse and run the little thumb wheel so that the stuff just went by and then here'd come one by where it would be red and I'd stop it and I'd read the line. I'd remember it because I wrote every one of those lines, they were easy to remember. And anyway, so that was a big aha moment for me and I realized that reality had to be much bigger than I thought. Because as a physicist, I thought if you can't measure it, it's either irrelevant or it's not real. That the only things that are real are things that can be measured. Anything unmeasurable in the physical world is, an, you know, it's part of your somebody's imagination. It's not a real thing. Well, that wasn't the case here. Obviously, there was something very real that was going on and there was no way at all to measure it. It was something happening between my computer code and my mind that didn't have a cause as far as I could tell. It just happened. So that opened up my reality and I thought, wow, there's a whole big part of reality that I really didn't even know existed before. The mind is a doorway to reality and I need to study that, you see. So that got me uh, uh, interested. And then it turned out that, I don't know, I guess some months later, probably six months later or so, I ended up you know, leaving graduate school, getting a job, and my boss had read Bob Monroe's book, Journeys Out of Body, and found out that Bob Monroe didn't live that far away from where I worked. So a bunch of us from work went out to see Bob Monroe. And I went out because I wanted to know, is this guy making it all up or is he serious? Well, I did meet Bob Monroe and Bob Monroe was in the process of just finishing the building a lab. But it was a build it and they will come. He had no idea what he was gonna do with it and he was looking for some scientists to help him work in that lab. So myself and another guy, Dennis Menerick, we volunteered. And uh, the deal was that he would teach us what he knew about out of body, because here I am, this physicist who just recently found out the world of mind is a, is a real thing, part of the real world, if you will, but a bigger dimension than just physical. And uh, I was interested in studying this mind. So myself and Dennis, we started spending, you know, 15 to 20 hours a week with Bob Monroe. And now I had a night job as well as a day job. So that was where it started. And from there, my job as the physicist was to come up with a theory. Why does it work? How does it work? What can you do? Where are the limitations? You know, what's the fundamental understanding that would make all this stuff make sense? How does out of body 
or remote viewing or mental healing actually make logical sense from a scientific viewpoint. So that was my challenge to try to integrate these things that I was learning to do with Bob Monroe with physics, with science. So I started thinking about a model and I came up with a set of facts that were facts of consciousness. This is how consciousness works. And that was from my own explorations and my own research in consciousness. After a while, I could duplicate altered states of consciousness pretty exactly. I could always go back to the exact same state I was in. So I could change a variable, you know, see what difference it made, go change another variable, see what difference it made. I could do research there. And eventually I had a bunch of facts of consciousness. Now these are all uh, subjective facts because it was my consciousness, my experience. It's not something that a group of us could stand around and, and poke at. It was my own experience. But I knew that these were facts because I didn't just look at them and make them up. I did research that let me eliminate other possibilities, leaving certain things to, that were just facts. Except Dennis corroborated your evidence. Oh yes, Dennis also was coming up with a lot of facts. So we were, you know, it wasn't just my idea alone. Right? And one of those experiments was with both of you corroborating each other's Evidence. Yes, we went. We had an out of body. This was a uh, an idea of Bob's. He had us both uh, meet above the lab, go out on an out of body adventure together, and then recorded what each of us said individually, and as we as it happened, you know, in real time. And then we came back, and he played that recording, which was two separate recordings. Uh, made of each of us and of course we were both in isolation booths different isolation booths that were acoustically isolated from each other so there was no way I could hear what he was saying or he could hear what I was saying matter of fact if one of us had screamed the other one would barely have heard it because the rooms were were uh, you know very well acoustically uh, isolated so yes there we were talking to each other answering each other's questions and it was clear that we both went on a journey together and we both saw all the same things and commented on them. So there was lots of evidence, but that was the one thing that let me know that, okay, it's real. That was kind of a, a, another big aha moment. You know, That's I had, pretty strong evidence. Yeah, I had, I had gathered lots and lots of evidence as far as statistics went. Dennis had too, that you know, there was one to a million that we could have done the things, gotten the information we got, just because we were good guessers, you know. So you do the statistics and it was, it was obviously something real was going on. But that's intellectual. This other thing that Dennis and I did together, that, was, that got at me at a deeper level. And after that, I didn't question anymore whether it was real. I only questioned, how does it work? So I spend the next 35 to 40 years still doing research, still trying to figure out how does it work until the late 1990s, I started writing it down. And this was to be a book of consciousness. But I knew that it was also going to be a book of science, but I didn't have a lot of that flushed out yet at that time, because I knew that consciousness was fundamental and the physical world, which is where the science is, was not. The physical world was derivative. And that's because I could change things in the consciousness world and things would change in the physical world. In other words, I could do something in consciousness that would create a change in the physical world, but it didn't go the other way. I couldn't do anything in the physical world that changed anything at all in consciousness. So that meant that consciousness was the fundamental reality, was the fundamental reality and that the physical reality was a derivative somehow of that fundamental reality. So that was that was one of my facts of consciousness. So now here I am, a physicist, and it's some 35 years later or so, and I've got this whole set of facts that are my facts of consciousness. And I have another big set of facts that are my facts of physical reality. And I tried to make a model that would answer all of those facts. One overarching set of ideas 
that would explain everything that I had, all my facts in the subjective world and all my facts in the objective world. And I did that. I, I wrote the book, My Big Toe, and that's why I called it The Big Toe, because it was a toe and it was bigger than other toes because it was both subjective and objective. So that's where the model came from. And then, about two years after I had published this book, and as I say, it was mostly consciousness theory, and it talked about science, because I knew science had to be derived from this conscious theory, but I didn't really know how to do that. But in about two years, it came to me. I realized that I could derive quantum mechanics from the very same principles that allow me to derive consciousness. This overarching set of principles actually had the solution to the double slit experiment explained logically, not explained with silly things like the particle interferes with itself, you know, those kinds of things. Particles don't interfere with themselves. You know, quantum mechanics is weird science. From the right perspective, it's not weird science. From the right perspective, a perspective gained from understanding consciousness, it works out perfectly. You don't need to shut up and do the math. You can just look at the logic and come to the answer, just like any other science. So at that point, I started looking for other things that uh, I could explain in the physical world. And it just took me a few days to, to realize that I could also explain relativity. Relativity is based on the fact that speed of light is always a constant. And my theory of consciousness said, well, of course, the speed of light always has to be a constant. It could not be any other way. Matter of fact, every reality that is information-based, or every virtual reality, has an upper speed limit. It's the nature of virtual reality. So then I solved that problem. Then I started looking for other, we call them paradoxes, things that people know are true because they've measured it in an experiment, but they have no idea why it's true. We call those paradoxes. And there's lots of them in physics. Lots of them in physics. Like, where did that ball of plasma come from that was the Big Bang that created our universe? Couldn't come from our universe because our universe didn't exist yet. It had to pre-exist our universe. But if our universe is everything there is, then that's a logical problem. How did that ball of plasma under that high temperature and pressure get there? Big paradox. There was a paradox called the Zeno paradox, which had to do with uh, if you measure a decaying atom quickly enough, if you keep measuring it, it'll never decay. And that was another paradox. There were paradoxes about basic physics, like where does time come from? Where does mass come from? Where does gravity come from? Where does spin come from? Where does charge come from? All the fundamentals of physics and all the rest of physics is based on those basic quantities and physicists have no idea where any of them come from. They're totally non-causal. And if you look at the philosophy of physics, they're just there because they're there. They have no cause. Well, that's not that's not very good. This is a science. You know, it's mysticism has no cause. You know, it's, uh, science uh, needs causes. With this understanding of consciousness, then I knew exactly what the causes were of time and space and mass and all the rest of that stuff were now not mysterious at all. They fell right out. So I looked at lots of paradoxes Paradoxes in physics, paradoxes in science in general, uh, paradoxes like the things that Bruce Lipton talks about. He talks about uh, these epigenetics that where conscious intent modifies the genetic structure of a body. And of course, that's a paradox. How could that happen? The placebo effect. How could that happen in a world that was just materialistic? Well, it couldn't. So those were all paradoxes. And this model of mine explains every one of them, how they work and why they work, what the limitations are, how much can you do, and why is it that you can't do everything, and why is it that they don't always work? 
uh, for some people as well as they do for others. And my model explains all of that. Philosophy paradox is included as well. Yes, there are basic philosophical paradoxes. One in particular, it's been around almost forever, but not quite forever, but 500 BC or so when Plato talked about his um, shadows on the wall of the cave, his, his cave shadows analogy. Uh, that started an argument between the idealists and the realists. Now the idealist basically thought that there was some ideal world that was behind or the origin of the physical world. And the physical world was just a, a subset or, or was um, dependent upon this ideal world. In other words, let's say a circle. A circle doesn't actually exist in our world. The perfect circle, the absolute perfect circle can't be drawn because there's always errors. There's always something that isn't quite right because you have to deal with the thickness of the pencil, you know, starts to create issues. So they thought, the idealists thought that the idea of a circle, this perfection had to exist somewhere else and just approximate circles would exist in our reality. Well, of course, we know that, that everything in our reality is basically an approximation of some sort. There are no perfect circles. Even a material itself isn't well defined. It's full of molecules that are jumping all around, you know, to find the, what's the perfect, you know, circle would need things that didn't jump around. So those things are not possible. Now, the other side of that was the realists. The realists said that the physical world just is because it is. It's here, it is, it's real. There isn't anything else. That's the end of it. Well, that turned in eventually to be the same argument, but it was the idealists against the realists who became materialists. That realist viewpoint was a materialist viewpoint as science in uh, what, uh, from the middle of the 1700s up through the, probably the middle of the, of the 20th century, science gained. It went from something that was kind of a hobby to something that was driving our whole world over that, like what, two centuries, century and a half. And the realists kind of won that argument and said, ah, obviously this physical reality is all there is and everything else is a bunch of baloney and hokum. And the idealists, case was put forth all over the place. There were lots of good uh, idealists in philosophy, but eventually the science and the engineering and the products that science created kind of overwhelmed the thinking of the idealist and materialism became the default answer for how the world works. And we're stuck now with that belief still today. Yet in the late 1800s and the first, oh, I don't know, the first five or 10 years of the 20th century, an experiment was done called the double slit experiment, which clearly came down on the side of the idealists. That experiment said that this reality cannot be materialistic. It is not a realist reality. And there wasn't any way really to escape that conclusion. So physicists at the time thought, wow, we've got a big new idea here. Big paradigm shift is about to take place, but they really didn't know what to do next. They had an experiment that said idealism is right. Realism is not. Materialism is not, but they didn't know what the next step would be, so they were stuck. Well, what happened is if you're stuck and then you're still stuck and a decade later you're still stuck, what you do is you start believing that the answer is it's impossible to know. And physics came to the conclusion that it's just impossible. One of these things that nature won't ever devolve and we will never know, it's impossible to know 
Quantum mechanics is just weird science. Get used to it. Shut up and calculate. Are there um, other paradoxes such as paranormal, theological? Yes, yes. There's lots of other paradoxes that were solved uh, with, this, with this idea. Matter of fact, all the paradoxes I've come across have been solved. You know, the epigenetics I mentioned is a paradox. The, uh, um, how the brain works, how consciousness, you know, is related to the brain, you know, called the hard problem in consciousness studies, you know, that's a paradox. Uh, neuroscience, um, you know, how do we resolve qualia and understand the feelings of things, how things make us feel, you know, and that is hard to explain, you know, in a, in a uh, materialist world. So there's a lot of things in biology in neuroscience and in uh, philosophy, as we as we mentioned, uh, yeah, a lot of paradoxes are resolved once you have this understanding of the way consciousness works. Even theology, which yeah, is surprising. even theology. You see, there's a paradox in theology that it looks at religion, theology, right? God-based religion. And it looks at it all over the planet in all sorts of societies, you know, indigenous people whose religions go back for, you know, millennia and, and uh, all the, the religions that are around now. And what they find is that there's a, there's a core there that's the same across all of those. They all have some of the basic concepts the same. Well, how would that happen? The only logical answer of why would all these very disparate groups that didn't communicate with each other, they're on different, you know, land masses, and these are things that happened a long time ago, how did they come up with similar answers? Now, some of their answers were quite, quite different as well, but the fundamentals tended to be similar. Well, that's a paradox, and how did that happen? The only way that they could end up being similar is if there was really something real there to it. They wouldn't just all come to a similar conclusion just by accident, you see. So that's kind of the, the paradox within religion. Uh, how did the religions find out the things they claim to be true in many different societies, in many different people, in many different places in the world, and mostly come up with similar answers? It all points to consciousness. It all points to consciousness, yes. So there are paradoxes in this reality that have been around for many millennia, not just one millennia, but two or three millennia, and uh, there's just been no answer to it. It's like, well, we just don't know. It sure is strange, isn't it? And then you go on because you don't have any answer, but now there's an answer. Once you understand consciousness, all these things resolve themselves logically. Science tells you why those paradoxes exist and where they came from and why would they be similar. You were unique in developing My Big Toe because you were not only a physicist but a consciousness explorer. The only way to uh, bring those two together is to be really proficient in both. Yes, that's kind of unusual. There's lots of people who have experienced things like um, uh, mental healing or out of body or remote viewing or the placebo effect even. There's lots of that that's around. People who have experience in, in doing these things, but very few of them are physicists. And there's a lot of you know, physicists around that understand the physical world, but most of those don't have these kinds of experiences. So it's different to have a person who does both sides, who has spent, well, you know, I started at, with Bob Monroe just soon after I got my first job in physics. So I've been a conscious researcher and a physicist for about 40 years. And I've been doing research all that time in the consciousness and I've been applying the physics all that time. So I've had dual career, 
in both. So it's not just a matter of experiencing phenomena. No doubt there are dozens of physicists who experience phenomena who, who can remote view, but they don't have the depth of the research within consciousness to actually create an overall model, scientific model of what's going on and why. So there's probably lots of physicists who are open-minded enough to realize that reality is more than just physical. That's not such a rarity anymore. Physicists tend to be pretty open-minded in that, in that way. But by coming up with a theory that uh, is very unusual, that they understand consciousness more than just the phenomena that shows that consciousness is there. It's just reaffirming the findings of the Copenhagen experiment, double slit experiment, that they knew consciousness was at the root of reality. And it took a little bit of time for someone to come up who was both a physicist and a consciousness researcher mm -hmm. to put those two together. Exactly. And it is very rare. Yeah, exactly, because they knew <laughs> consciousness is involved. You know, and they all pretty much said that, most of them did. You know, we have quotes from Planck and from Bohr and from Einstein and Heisenberg. They all had this idea that consciousness was key here because the conscious observer was an integral part of how the physics worked. So they knew consciousness was some part of it, but they, again, they just didn't know where to take the next step. So it just sat there because nobody knew that much about consciousness. Nobody really understood how consciousness worked and what it was. There was no model of consciousness that they had to work with. So that was my contribution after spending 40 years studying it and having worked with Bob Monroe, I came up with a model of consciousness, which then created a model of physics and biology and all the rest of that stuff. It is our best model so far of reality. And we thank you for yeah. this discussion and for developing My Big Toe. Well, I think it's the best model so far, but I keep looking for better things and I keep looking for things that this model doesn't explain. If there's a paradox, and again, the paradox has to be a fundamental, you know, a fundamental paradox. If there's some fundamental paradox it doesn't explain, then that would mean the, the model is not complete. And that would be something I would like to work on. So I've been looking for these things now for five or six years. I've been looking very hard, actually more like 10 years for things that it doesn't explain. And I haven't really found anything yet that it doesn't build a f scientific foundation under. I think that says a lot for the theory. Thank you so much, Tom, for this synopsis of My Big Toe. You're welcome, Donna. My pleasure. <laughs>